good to be able to worship with our church family. Thank you for being here on the Lord's Day and gathering together as the Word of God commands us to do. Uh, we are blessed because of it, to be able to come together as a family of faith. We want to continue in worship by turning in our Bibles to the New Testament, the book of Colossians chapter 4. As we continue walking through this wonderful letter from the Apostle Paul to the church of Colossae, and for us as well, we benefit from the study of God's Word as He speaks into our life. You know, the wonderful thing about the book of Colossians is that it's so Jesus-centered and Jesus-saturated. Everything always comes back to Him, and that should be the life of the Christian, uh, to recognizing that He is to be uh, the center of our lives, and our lives ought to be saturated in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. As we've been walking through this book together, I know that you've noticed a theme. The beginning of the book of Colossians talks about Jesus as the King of glory. He is our hope. And the Bible even refers to him here in this letter as the hope of glory who is in our lives as our Lord and as our Savior. But understanding things theologically and then living them out uh, in a way that uh, manifests that or demonstrates that, they, they don't always seem to go together. The Christian life is one where many times if we would confess, we recognize there are many things that we believe, but it hasn't always impacted the way that we live. And the Apostle Paul says here in this New Testament letter, it ought to change the way that we live. If Jesus has saved us and changed us, it ought to change the way that we live our lives practically for him. And so as we've made our way through this book, we're in chapter 4, and we began last week looking at Paul's words in verses 2. Two weeks ago, we looked at verses 2 and verse 3, and here's what he said. He said, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, and at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I might make it clear which is how I ought to speak. And so Paul, speaking to the believers there, he says, listen, as you spend time in prayer, would you pray for me? Isn't it great when you have people that are willing to pray for you? Amen. Amen. And he says, pray for me. And he's asking for prayer for some specific things. He's asking that they would pray that God would, would open a door. He's, he's praying for those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would hear the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ and that they would understand it with clarity. Paul is saying, would you pray for these things as you pray in your life? And so we talked about the importance of prayer in the life of someone who belongs to the kingdom of God. Now, in these next verses, he's going to talk not only about the importance of kingdom praying, but he's going to talk about the importance of kingdom witnessing. He says here in verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And so one of the things out of the gate that we see is that the apostle Paul has asked for prayer. He says, look, I'm going to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Would you pray for me? He says, would you pray for me as I go to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ? Pray for open doors, open opportunities. Pray that I present that with clarity. But he also makes a distinction here to show us that sharing your faith and sharing the gospel story isn't just for preachers, pastors, and missionaries. It's for all of us. He says, listen, pray for me as I go and share. But then he goes on to talk about how we as fellow believers ought to share the good news as well. And so he begins with just these verses here. He says it again this way, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. 
So Paul begins to talk about our interaction with a group of people, and I want you to notice the word that he uses. The word is outsiders. And we hear that word outsiders, and perhaps you're thinking maybe Paul is is using a negative or a derogatory term here, and that's not the case. Paul doesn't use a a phrase or a label that says something like that they are enemies as if they were in battle with them or that they were opponents as if they were playing against them on a team sport. He doesn't use the word enemy. He doesn't use the word opponent. He uses the word outsider. And I think it's significant. And again, not in a derogatory way, but in a distinctive way. He's describing those who we will encounter in everyday life. Think about it in these terms. Do you remember how the Apostle Paul talked about our lives before we met Jesus Christ? In chapter 1 of the book of Colossians, he wrote these words in this way. He talked in chapter 1 about how there it was Christ who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, he has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I think this is important. When he talks here in chapter four about the outsiders, he's talking about those who are described in the way that we once were. You see, he talks about how through God in Christ, the way that God takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, how God rescues us from our sins. He delivers us of our sins and how he brings redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. I think all of this is important because when you think about who is Paul talking to when we interact with the world and he makes this phrase about interacting with outsiders, understand this, he's talking here about those who are outside the family of God, those who are outside the kingdom of God, those who are in spiritual darkness, those who are in need of rescue. And those who need redemption. All of these are important to remember as Paul's talking about this group of individuals, the outsiders. He says we are to walk in wisdom towards these outsiders, making the best use of the time, letting our speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, that we may know how to answer each person. Now, as we consider the group that he is uh, speaking with, he begins to share how we ought to do that. Now, what you're going to notice is is where Colossians chapter 1 and even Colossians chapter 2 and into 3 is very heavy on theology and doctrine. Colossians chapter 4 is significant in how we put that into practice. And it's very practical and applicable in the way that he speaks. He's giving us much application here. And what I want to do is give you three statements of application that he gives us here in the text. The first one is this, number one, that we are to walk wisely as unbelievers are watching. To walk wisely as unbelievers are watching. Now, what I would tell you is, is when he uses this word wisely or speaking of wisdom here, wisdom is not a matter of intelligence but a matter of integrity. This is significant because Paul is telling all of us that we are to walk in wisdom and we are to walk with integrity. This is not an intelligence issue. This isn't whether or not that uh, you would find yourself to be a, a super smart Christian or an intelligent Christian. This really is about integrity. Now, in the Bible, when you see the word integrity used in our modern English translations, it, that word is going to come from one of, of six words. There are four in the Hebrew language, two in the Greek language that are often used to talk about walking with integrity. And those words that are used are 
uh, arranged in such a way or applied in such a way that it speaks to things about things like this, living a straight life, not a, a crooked life. That makes sense, doesn't it? Being honest and trustworthy. That makes sense. Being uh, beyond corruption. That makes sense. And being able to live in a way that is right and, and righteous. And so those words that you see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that we translate for the word integrity are certainly applicable here. He's talking about us walking in wisdom. And here's what integrity is. Integrity is, is when there is a oneness between belief and behavior. And that is integrity. There is a soundness to it. That is to say that you, you would say, I believe this, and it actually impacts the way that you live. Does that make sense? So there is this aspect of he's talking about us walking with Christian integrity, being able to have a oneness between belief and behavior, a oneness with our character and our conduct, these things coming together. And all of these things are important, but one of the reasons it's important is, is we're called to walk wisely because there are unbelievers who are watching. James chapter 3 and verse 13 says it this way, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It doesn't say who is wise among you by his intelligence show the wisdom. It says by what? Good conduct, the way that we live. This is exactly what Paul is even referring to here in the book of Colossians, that we are to walk wisely, walk with a sense of integrity. And understanding this, someone's always watching. Someone's always watching. We may never know the impact that our life testimony is going to have, that our behavior is going to have on others. And so with that being said, let me take just a few moments here of pastor privilege. Let me give you some counsel on what it looks like to, to have character based on the word of God. Let me tell you what it looks like to be able to, to live wisely. Here, here's, here's the first point. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Now, a hypocrite is not someone who uh, sometimes stumbles in sin. A, a, a hypocrite is one who is not genuine. They say they believe something, but they live their lives in behavior for something else. And one of the things that we've got to recognize is, is that there are many unbelieving people in the world that want to use the hypocrisy of Christians as their excuse for not coming to faith. And it shouldn't be that way. Now, certainly it is an excuse that we, we don't want to see, but, but can I say this to you? Be a stairway for somebody's faith, not a stumbling block. Let people see Christ in you. And, and so don't be a hypocrite. Be genuine in your faith. Allow the things that you believe affect the way that you live. Another way that we ought to be able to live is, is don't be ashamed don't be ashamed. You know, so many uh, Christians, you see them today, they, they, they almost live apologetically for what they believe or the beliefs that they hold. And, and they just become sheepish about such things in the world because they understand that the, 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 the flow of culture today doesn't align with God's word in so many ways. And you get Christians are all kind of sheepish and apologetic about it. And, and you say, hey, listen, is that what you believe? Well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, you know. Well, that's just not going to encourage anybody. The reality is, is we ought to embrace the way that the apostle Paul talks about it in Romans, right? He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Listen, we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Amen. We ought to be able to have a confidence about what we believe and the one to whom we believe. We ought to have a confidence about that and, and not be ashamed. This goes without saying, but we should say this. If you're a Christian, don't be mean. Don't be mean. There is a, a sense of where he's talking about being gracious. 
First Peter chapter 3.15 talks about approaching things with a sense of, of gentleness. We, we ought to be a people that live a life of kindness because it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. And we ought to embody that kindness in our life. And sometimes you just meet some Christians and they just, well, they just come across as mean-spirited. And that shouldn't be the way that it is. Another thing that I would encourage you when you think about walking wisely is don't be arrogant. Many times we see this in the church. It's an approach where sometimes a Christian may present themselves to the non-Christian as morally superior. And the reality is, is that we are just like the non-Christians except for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no moral superiority apart from the Holy Spirit indwelling our life. Recognizing that if we present ourselves with a sense of spiritual arrogance, there are times that we can put off the non-believer, the unbeliever. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have confidence. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel, but we need to be careful not to have arrogance to assume that we are better than somebody else. The one who is better is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all need him in our life. Not being arrogant requires to live a life of humility. And it's not easy to be humble. It's not easy to live a life of humility. It certainly isn't the way of the world, but it was the character of Jesus Christ. And so I would encourage you in this, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be ashamed don't be mean, don't be arrogant, but I've got one more. Don't be weird. <laughs> Can I just say that? Don't be weird. I, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. There's sometimes you, you, you meet uh, uh, unbelievers and they say, you know, well, some of you Christians are weird. And can I say this? Some of our Christians are weird. <laughs> uh, but, but here's the thing. If, if, if you're a weird Christian, don't blame that on Jesus. That's on you. All right? I, I, I mean this with all sincerity. Let me, let me say this. The Bible does call us to be a peculiar people, but that's not what it meant. It calls us to be a separate people. There ought to be a distinctive nature about your life. Now, if the world thinks that's weird, that's one thing. But listen, don't be weird. Just understanding, we are, we are talking about things that can change the eternity of a soul. Let's not get caught up in, in some of the weird things that we Christians can sometimes get caught up in. You know, our lives ought to show people Jesus. This is what the Apostle Paul was asking for earlier. Pray as I go and I share that there's an open door. Pray that the lost would hear the word, that there would be clarity. And then he turns around and says, and now you, you walk in wisdom as you live your life before the outsiders, before people that are still in darkness, still in spiritual darkness, those people who are in need of rescue and people that are in need of redemption. He says, you live in such a way. That points people to Jesus Christ. So the first thing, walk wisely as unbelievers are watching. Number two, act with an awareness that the present time is precious and that more time isn't promised. How much would it change the way that we live if we truly got this point? Act in a way that the present time is precious and that more time isn't promised. He says here in verse 5, making the, the best use of the time. The best use of the time. The old translation would say redeeming the time. Other translations would say make the most of every opportunity. There's something about time that we must consider is that the time that we do have in the present, it's precious. More time, not promised. James says it this way in James chapter 4 and verse 14, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. 
What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You know, over the last week and a half, we've, we've had approximately 15 people in our church or church family that have passed away. That's a lot. Family members of church members had a number of people. There were people that were in worship with us just a couple of Sundays ago that are not worshiping here. They're worshiping at the throne of God. And I'll tell you, but here's the thing. We do not know what tomorrow brings. Attended a funeral yesterday for one of our church members. And after I got home, before the day was done, received a phone call of another church member's parent that had passed away. We do not know what tomorrow holds. The present time we have is precious. And the time for tomorrow, it's not promised. And we ought to live our lives in such a way. Listen, not just for your life, but for the lives of people that you encounter. The people that you come face to face with, they might go into eternity tomorrow and will we have done what we should have done to introduce them to eternal life in glory in heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. Or after they take their last breath on earth, will their eternity be something far different? separated forever from the presence of God. Oh, do you understand that this is significant in what Paul says here? Just a few words, but it means so much. Making the best use of time. As Greg Laurie says, the gospel is only good news to them if it gets there on time. The gospel is not good news to them. If it arrives too late. Christians, we've got to make the best use of our time. Being able to live for those that are in spiritual darkness, those who are in need of rescue, those who are in need of redemption. We need to act with an awareness that the present time is precious and that more time isn't promised. I want to share with you one of the individuals in our church family that recently passed away, many of you all know John Rice. And one of the things about John is John suffered several different things towards the end of his life, physical ailments and, and some mental ailments and other things. But let me tell you what John did. And I don't know how long John's been doing this, but John, uh, when I met him, he gave me a copy of his testimony. John says, Here, here's a copy of my testimony. It was a story of his life being changed by Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and he had that testimony. And as John learned about his declining health, something in him began to, uh, with a greater sense of urgency, make sure that he was telling more people and sharing his testimony with more people. I went by John and Sandy's house after he passed away and sitting in a room right off of the front door, sitting in a room was a a table next to a chair and it was stacks of his testimony folded that he could grab on the way out the door to give to people so that they might know the hope of Jesus Christ. That's being able to live knowing that the precious, the present time is precious and more time isn't promised. And God may use you in a different way to be able to share the gospel story, but that's a way that it just reminds me of we don't know what tomorrow brings. And so being able to introduce people to the Lord Jesus Christ and encourage them. Now, I wish I could tell you that every one of those handouts that John gave out uh, were well-received. Some people would respond back. He left contact information. People would share their thoughts and And just in the last few weeks alone, some of the testimonies we got back, people thanked him for sharing. We had a witch saying they were going to curse the church because he shared a testimony. We, we've had uh, all kinds of, you know what? That's not on John, is it? He was faithful. You be faithful. There's going to be times that you're going to share your testimony and there are going to be people that are receptive to it. There are going to be people that just going to think about it. There's going to be people that just move on. But again, Let us live our lives in such a way that reflects Jesus Christ. 
because even in those that are uh, not readily receptive to it, they are still a soul headed to eternity. And we have the opportunity to show and to share Jesus with them. So number one, walk wisely as unbelievers are watching. Number two, act with an awareness that the present time is precious and that more time isn't promised. Now, number three, start kingdom conversations with unbelievers. Start kingdom conversations with unbelievers. That's exactly what he's saying in the latter part of these two verses, isn't it? it let your speech, let your speech, not let the missionary speech, the preacher's speech, the pastor's speech, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. He's telling all of us as Christians how we ought to Speak up, speak out, and kingdom conversations. And I understand when I have this type of a, a lesson that comes to us through the word of God, there are many that, that, that kind of go, oh, that just feels so awkward for me to do, pastor, to be able to share. And, and can I just go ahead and be really honest with you? You're in the kingdom of God because somebody shared with you. The vast majority of us were introduced to the gospel through the conversation of someone and so recognizing that's important God chooses to use us in such a way so we start these kingdom conversations with unbelievers you know he's been talking about letting your conduct speak Jesus and now he's talking about what let your conversation speak Jesus so where you Christians and, and, and when, when we have Christians that are out here that will say well I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna win people by the way that I live I won't ever need to really talk about the gospel I'll just I'm just going to live the gospel I'll witness through my life well first of all for a lot of us that's a dangerous thing but I do want us to understand you have opportunity to be able to speak Jesus to someone, to speak the gospel to someone. And one of the great effects is, is when we have conversations that work best when we involve both our lives and our lips. Putting both of those things together helps point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have those kingdom conversations with these unbelievers. Let me give you a couple thoughts under this one. Here's the first one. We need to see unbelievers as people and not as projects. Sometimes in our zeal as the church, we, we, we talk in terms of, of reaching people in numbers and all of that is significant. But listen, listen, every number is a soul. But we need not to get to a place where, where we don't see people any longer as people. We just see them as projects. Uh, listen, you're not checking off boxes. You're not collecting scalps. You're sharing hope and truth to where they can find eternal life in Jesus Christ. See people as people. Don't allow it to ever get impersonal. Don't ever allow evangelism to become impersonal. Evangelism is not a program. It's not a program. People are not a project. See them for who they are. Another good word here is to seek common ground. You know, many people will say, Pastor, I, I'm not opposed to having a conversation about Jesus or the kingdom of God with people, but my goodness, I don't even know where to jump in. I mean, you know, a lot of our conversations, you know, revolve around sports or revolve around politics or revolve around, you know, where we live geographically. Those kind of conversations, they just seem to come naturally. You can just talk about all of these types of different things, but man, when it comes to talking Jesus, that's difficult. I don't even know where to start. And what I would encourage you is, is to do as the apostle Paul and to seek common ground. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share 
in its blessings. He's, he's looking for connection points, common ground that he can help bring people to Christ, having that opportunity to bring some of those things together. And a final thought under this starting kingdom conversations with unbelievers. Speak truth with grace and for impact. When you have these kingdom conversations, you, you speak with, with grace, but also you speak for impact. He, he says in verse 6 to be gracious and seasoned with salt. And I think both of these things are important. We are gracious because we've been shown grace by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says to season it with salt. Now, he's not saying use salty language. He's saying season this with, with salt. Now, what does salt do? It impacts whatever it's applied to. And you want to look for ways to, again, be impactful in that conversation. Don't, don't be sheepish about it. If the Lord opens that opportunity to continue in that conversation, you want to be able to have impact with that. And you never know the lives that you might touch. Several years ago, I was moved by a video that was done by a, a national entertainer. His, his name is uh, Penn Gillette. You might know him connected to Penn and Teller. Uh, they do a variety of acts. They also had television show and major entertainer, uh, absolutely abrasive, foul-mouthed individual, avowed atheist, uh, celebrated atheist, doesn't believe in God, thinks all of you in this room right now are absolutely idiotic. He does. Thinks you're crazy for believing what you believe. But he shared a video. There were, there were times after his show that he would go into his dressing room and he would shoot a video and he would just kind of decompress and, and debrief and capture some of his thoughts on the day. And on one occasion, he shares, again, understanding who he is, abrasive atheist, antagonistic, and thinks all of you all are foolish. But he goes after a show and he starts talking and he says, um, you know, he said, tonight I had a guy come up to me and, and hand me a little Gideon Bible. And here's what he said. He said, the man was winsome and very kind. He said, he looked me in the eye as he began to share what he believed about eternity. And here's what he said. He said, I don't believe any of that stuff. But he says, I don't respect someone who does believe it and isn't willing to tell somebody. He goes on to say it this way. He says, if you truly believe that someone's soul is headed to an eternity, he said, if you truly believe that someone without Jesus is headed to hell, and if you truly believe that there is a heaven and everlasting life, and if you truly believe that, here's what he said, how much do you have to hate someone not to tell them? I would love to tell you that at the end of that night, he bowed his head and he called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has not. He's still an avowed atheist. But you never know the impact you can have when you deal with people, give them truth with grace and for impact. It made an impact on him. And we don't know the seed that was sown in that moment. He may never come to faith, but do you know we need to be faithful as a witness. You know, there's too much at stake, isn't there? Too much at stake. What's at stake? Some of your family members? Some of your family members? Loved ones? Some of your friendships? The person you work next to Monday through Friday. The person you see on your street mowing their lawn. There's too much at stake.
Penn went on to say, he says, I, I don't understand how someone could believe all of that and not say anything just because they think it's socially awkward. Even the atheist understood was, what was at stake. He just didn't believe. Listen, I don't know who God brings to your mind, maybe a name, maybe a face right now, where God can use you to make a difference in somebody's life and to share the hope that we have in Christ. You know, in our next service, as we see the baptistry again, uh, seeing believers baptism, I'm, I'm excited. And it all begins because someone shared the good news with someone else. Let that be said of us. Amen. Amen. Father, we just pray that you'll use this word today to challenge us practically to live out what we believe theologically and biblically, God. We pray uh, if we truly believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, that he is the only hope for eternity. Father, would you allow us to uh, just help us to lay aside all of our reasons and excuses for not being so bold and gracious in this world to point people to Jesus. Help us to live unashamed. And Father, as we sow seeds, we know only the Holy Spirit can do the saving work. But God, we pray that it may be so. And Lord, the way that we respond to this message today, may it bear fruit in the coming days, weeks, months, and even years ahead. Help us to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.